somewhere right around, right before 3 p.m. or so. And at about 3 p.m. of July 3rd, about 13,000 Southern soldiers began to march out of the trees over there. Now the battle lines, just for Pickett's charge alone, stretched over a mile up and down the opposing ridge. It was not a solid and unbroken line. There were gaps in between different units, but the overall effect was over a mile, and it had some extra depth. The Confederates had the first battle line two rows deep marching towards us, and a few hundred yards behind that, there were other Confederate battle lines also two rows deep marching towards us. This is the trees. The unions thought once they began, were they like, are these guys crazy, or were they actually intimidated by the fact that they were? Very, very impressed was a common theme. They were just incredibly impressed with the Confederates as they moved forward. Um, And, and some, I can remember reading some accounts that, that were, that said it was very intimidating. That's but, what I would imagine, yeah. I, I think the, the, the most common aspect of those accounts of the Union soldiers is that when they saw these Confederate battle lines emerging from the woods, they just thought it was an amazing spectacle. And they just, they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. Were they shocked that they were even attempting this? Uh, or, I, I mean, what, what, what? I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say shocked. No, no. More at least I, I'm not saying. I, I'm sure there were some might have been, but the but the common theme seems to be that they were. I, I think part of the reason that they were not shocked is because the cannonade that the Confederates launched had centered, and I'll say had focused in an area for several hundred yards along this ridge. So they knew that an idea was coming. And were their artillery effective, or was it? not nearly as, as much as it needed to be. Okay. This is one of Lee's greatest miscalculations. In theory, if that artillery bombardment had eliminated more cannon over here on the Union side, it's possible the, the Confederate infantry attack might have worked. But the artillery bombardment from the Confederate point of view was nowhere near as effective as it needed to be. Some Union cannon were disabled and destroyed, no question, but not enough. Why was that? I think it's a number of things. Number one, I'm gonna say smoke and confusion. After a short time, the smoke builds up so much along these ridges that no, anyone, no one can barely see what they're shooting at. And, and shells are exploding everywhere. So it's kind of hard to even exactly know, well, which, which shell was ours? Was that ours over there? Was that somebody else's that just exploded? Um, so it makes it tough to adjust your aim. Uh, but here's another thing that hurts. Defective fuses were a constant problem in the Civil War. Some of the fuses would cause the shells to explode too soon, some too late, some would not explode at all, and the Confederates had another uh, logistical problem with fuses. A few months before this battle, a major Confederate arsenal in Richmond had burned down, and it was an arsenal that manufactured a lot of the Confederate artillery fuses. Now, so what started happening was this, in the next few months before this battle occurred, the Confederates started to receive fuses from a different southern arsenal. Sounds okay, right? The problem is that the fuses they were receiving at this point had a slightly different rate of burn. And as a result, the Confederates were setting the fuses to what they believed was the proper time for them to explode above the heads of the enemy, and instead, many of the shells were exploding on the back side of the ridge after it already cleared the Union lines. Uh, so, a number of logistical things, but, but even throughout the war, dud fuses were a constant thorn in the side of, of artillery officers, particularly in the Confederate side. You see that, quite a, that theme quite a lot. Um, but I think smoke and confusion had a lot to do with it, too. Mm -hmm. Now, at about 3 p.m. when the Confederates' battle lines begin to advance, initially they're marching slowly. Again, it was a hot July day. They had to go almost a mile. But as soon as they cleared the trees, Union cannon over here began to fire with solid shells and with exploding shells. The Confederates keep advancing, and eventually they approach the Emmitsburg Road where you see the, the wooden fences. When they approach that road, the Union cannon begin to fire canister fire, those shotgun-like blasts of iron balls. And then another critical thing begins to happen. Union infantry soldiers begin to open fire with their rifles. For several hundred yards to the north and several hundred yards to the south, 
Union soldiers began to shoot over top of these farmers' rock walls. The fire was so deadly, some Confederates would not move past the Emmitsburg Road. Some shot from the road. But thousands of other Confederates did continue to advance. And those wooden fences along that road, that's a critical obstacle to get past. It really broke down the momentum of the advancing troops. Now, the Confederates that are still moving forward, now they must move forward more quickly. They are now within accurate rifle range. They can't just stand out there. So the Confederate officers began to scream at their men to move forward at the quick step, like a slow jog. And when they get closer, they scream out the order for the double quick step. Now, they're moving faster, but men on both sides are falling at every second that goes by. And to even make it more confusing, the Confederate battle lines out there are getting all mixed up with each other. So it's turning into like a, a melee of humanity. You have different mobs and different clusters of soldiers who are surging towards the Union lines up and down this ridge. Just on the other side of these rock walls, some Confederates got close enough that they made an all-out charge. Now, when some charged, we believe, we don't know for sure, I'm going to say maybe about 300 Confederates poured over the rock walls and got into this area. This area that we stand is called the angle because out near that big tree, the stone wall makes a 90 degree angle. But now we call this whole general area the angle. And now there's definitely some hand to hand fighting in the angle. But now the Confederates have another problem. Union generals, including Meade, are pulling in reinforcements. A few Union regiments are rushing from the back slopes of Cemetery Ridge and a few other regiments after they had beaten back the part of the attack down this way, started to rush towards the angle from that direction. And as these reinforcements are moving in, they're beginning to surround the Confederates who advanced over the rock walls. And finally, maybe about quarter to four, again, we don't know for certain, that's as far as the attack would go. The 300 or so Confederates in the angle have almost all been either captured or wounded or killed. And here's maybe the most important factor. The Confederates started this attack on the other side with close to 13,000 men, but most had to turn back. The deadly rifle and cannon fire up and down this ridge from the Union side is so overwhelming, most Confederates would not even be able to reach the main Union line, much less make a breakthrough. So at this point, the, or excuse me, at this point, the Confederates start to fall back away from Cemetery Ridge back to Seminary Ridge. Again, we have the two similar ridge names. In less than one hour, Lee's army had taken almost 7,000 casualties. Almost 7,000 troops either killed or wounded or missing or captured. That was for one army <clears throat> in less than an hour. Now, with the end of this attack, whether we call it Longstreet's Assault or whether we call it by the popular name Pickett's Charge, whatever we name this, this attack against the center of the Union lines was the final major fighting at Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, 
the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.